Well, we have had a very good time the last first, first couple days here. Uh, I'm thankful that God saved much people alive. You know, when, when Joseph was in Egypt, he didn't just save a, a few families alive with his corn. He saved much people alive, even people from far away from Egypt. So we have a great salvation. <clears throat> the aspect I'd like to look at today of what Christ has accomplished on our behalf is Christ satisfying of God, and in, in particular how this uh, relates to perfection, how perfection relates to, to Christ satisfying God. Now, just an o- overview of what we're going to be looking at. First of all, we'll think about the requirements for God to be satisfied. Then we'll see the fact of God's satisfaction with Christ. And finally, the implications of us having a satisfied God. Isaiah 53, verse 10, says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So here, in, inside this, this whole chapter talking of Christ's death, we see this phrase, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Now I'm going to stop kind of abruptly here because I believe it does a great disservice to this verse to try to expound it without first establishing an understanding of what it takes to satisfy God. So without an understanding of God's righteous demands, we cannot appreciate the magnitude of Christ's work. So let's look at what is required to satisfy God. What does God demand? And to see this, we'll go all the way back to Genesis 17, verse 1. God, it says, when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. So what, first of all, why should God be satisfied? Well, God says, I am the Almighty God. He should be satisfied because of who he is, because of his nature. And I don't think anyone here would argue with that. God deserves to be satisfied. Next, in in whose eyes is Abraham walking? God said, walk before me. See, God says, you live and you know that I'm watching. Live in God's eyes. Live with the awareness awareness that God sees all and knows all. And in this setting, what does God demand? He says, be thou perfect. That's what satisfies God. Perfection. Now, it should be noted that God's demands on humanity are governed by his own nature and not by humanity. So if this sounds like a a strange, if it sounds like too big of a request on man, well, that's because we are men. And in fact, this is perfectly appropriate for God to demand perfection. God is satisfied with perfection. Now, Just in case you thought this was just an Old Testament demand, Jesus said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So he upped the requirements even more. Be perfect like God is perfect. So from this, we can conclude that God is not easy to satisfy. God is not easy to satisfy. In general, God has been very unsatisfied with the human race. 
The man's imperfection, primarily demonstrated in the form of sin, has been the defining characteristic of mankind. Men are imperfect. But its abundance has not made God the slightest bit more accepting of it. God does not become satisfied with something just because he sees a lot of it. He is not de de affected by man. To, to demonstrate this, in Leviticus 10, gives us an account of, of a bit of imperfection. Leviticus 10 and verse 1, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now, they were still offering incense. They were still offering it before the Lord. And these were the appropriate people to be offering incense. They were anointed priests, but they didn't do it in the way God wanted it. It wasn't perfect, and God destroyed them. And this is a principle that applies everywhere. What does God do with that with which he is unsatisfied? He burns it up. And that applies everywhere. If there is something which is perpetually in a state which God is not satisfied with, God will burn it up. Yeah. Amen. Now this is bad news for us because all have sinned. And it, it speaks that we have impending doom coming upon each, each man who is imperfect. But God sent Moses... Moses had the law, and the law told us that if we sin, we can offer this sacrifice. This is God establishing the idea of, of a vicarious sacrifice. That maybe if we bring these things to God, maybe God will be satisfied with us if we come with sacrifices and offerings. But regarding this, this concept of perfection... What, what should we bring? You know, what sacrifice would be good enough to make God satisfied? Because God is satisfied with perfection. And Micah's, Micah pondered this. He says, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. So here we see that what God desires is a perfect heart. He desires what's within a man, and perfection must be there. Now in order for us to be made perfect, we need a perfect sacrifice. Amen. And when he was considering what he could bring before God, he's thinking, how many sacrifices do I need? Well, perfection is not something that you can build up to. You know, 9,999 rivers of oil, not quite enough. But maybe if we got one more river of oil, we would be perfect. You see how foolish this is. No, if you need more than one sacrifice, it just means that those sacrifices are imperfect. So, conclusion regarding us offering sacrifices is in Hebrews 10, where it says, The law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because the, the worshippers once purged should have no, had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So even those offering these sacrifices had a witness within themselves of their conscience that God was not satisfied with this. Their consciences could never be made pure. 
And see, the basic problem with these sacrifices was that they did not, they could not make the people perfect. And God needed perfection, and these sacrifices could not provide that. They were a shadow, but not the very image. So it is clear that we needed something else. We needed something untainted by the hands of men. And so I'll continue reading in verse 5 of Hebrews 10. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sins thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offering and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Now here, he makes it clear that the solution, this new solution, is of a completely different nature than that of the old. The perfection is not simply an improved imperfection. And God was not unsatisfied with just the quality or the quantity of these sacrifices, but with their very nature. We needed a perfect sacrifice. And so continuing on, it's, it, the subject is God's will, which says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after that he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And we could see the great contrast between Christ and and anything or anyone who came before him. They failed to satisfy God, and Jesus did satisfy God. Amen. And the, the, the reason he satisfied God is because he dealt with the basic problem which we had in approaching a holy God, is that we were imperfect, and he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. He has made us holy and righteous before God, with no iniquity at all. Amen. And Jesus accomplished what he came to do. You see, the price was paid, the people were perfected, and God was satisfied. <clears throat> Little, a couple verses later, he says, Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. See, there's no more offering. That means God was satisfied. Amen. If God doesn't remember your sins and iniquities, what more reason is there for you to try to pay for them? Be like Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Amen. And now we can begin to understand what a great, great word this is that he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Because, because Christ made, made us perfect. And there were many men who were in travail of soul, but that was not enough to satisfy God. Even righteous men, but Jesus was a perfect man. And that's why he could satisfy God. Now you may say, how do we know God is satisfied? How do we know Jesus' sacrifice wasn't as imperfect as all the ones that were before? Well, there are, God has not left us without witness on this. Uh, first of all, it was one sacrifice. It says in Hebrews 9 that Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. 
But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Amen. Now Jesus is not offering himself for sins anymore. Now if Jesus were still offering himself for sins, we would have to conclude that his sacrifice was imperfect. But as we mentioned earlier that the reason for multiple sacrifices is because none of the sacrifices were perfect. But Jesus does not have this problem. He offered himself once. In addition to this, we could see that Jesus satisfied God because he rose from the dead. It says, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. See, death is related to sin. It says, by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. We know the wages of sin is death. And the sting of death is sin. <coughs> so death is a result of sin. Now Jesus rose from the dead. Death could not hold him. And that shows us that he was without sin. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was that perfect sacrifice which we needed. In addition, his, his resurrection, when we view it in context of Isaiah 53, this is talking about God's satisfaction and being pleased with Jesus. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, and here's the resurrection, he shall see his seed. He's going to see his descendants. And he shall prolong his days. Jesus' days were prolonged because the Lord delighted in him, delighted in his sacrifice. And he rose, raised him from the dead. He did not leave his soul in hell. Amen. <clears throat> and where did Jesus go after he rose? When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Do you sit down when the work is done? The God is satisfied. Jesus' work when it, with atoning for sin is done. Jesus is sitting down. That's how we know Jesus, God is satisfied. <clears throat> so Jesus has satisfied God. And such a great work, such a great and eternal work, does not have minor effects and results. You know, when God went from unsatisfied to satisfied, there was no one who was unaffected. And as God is pleased, he has opened up full and free access to the river of his pleasures. And so let's think about some results and implications of God, Christ perfecting us and God being satisfied. First of all, as always should be first, Christ what does Christ get? Christ rose from the dead because God was satisfied. He was not left in hell. His soul did not see corruption. He was vindicated of all those who accused him of sin because he overcame death. He was without sin. And uh, as Brother Aaron said, he, he took the keys of hell and of death. Also, Jesus received great promises. The Verse 12 of Isaiah 53, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. So Jesus received great things for his perfecting work, for his satisfying work. You know, a few, uh, the heathen, have been given to him as his inheritance. You know, his enemies right now are being made his footstool. And he's been given a name which is above every name. Jesus received great rewards for this perfecting work. <clears throat> now, in a, on our behalf, we know that the theme of this is, is what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. And glory to God, the things which Christ has done provide great benefits to us as well. <clears throat> For us, it means that we are under a new covenant. It says that he has made us accepted in the beloved. And now Jesus, God is satisfied with Jesus, and we are in Jesus. 
So this, this is a completely different approach to God, a completely different situation than we were under the law. Because Christ has perfected forever them which are sanctified. What does this mean? Paul says that he wanted to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. See, what does this mean? This means that now we don't even want our own righteousness anymore. <laughs> because if you add imperfection to perfection, it's not going to make the perfection any better. God is satisfied already with Christ. <clears throat> it means that we are unblameable. Colossians 1.21 and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. See, the wrath of God is no longer abiding on you because God is satisfied with Jesus' sacrifice for sins. In fact, you have been made perfect. There is no sin that can be laid to your charge with Christ's atoning sacrifice on your behalf. And God is satisfied with that. <clears throat> it means our consciences are pure. If the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. We have been given a clean conscience. Where, where are your accusers? Has no man accused you? <laughs> who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Our consciences are pure because God has justified us. And we can be satisfied with that because God is. <clears throat> and I believe maybe the greatest work of God, Christ satisfying of God and perfecting of us is that we have boldness to draw near. I'm going to continue on in Hebrews 10, verse 19. Having therefore, see therefore it's talking about all those things which were before. The things which Christ, speak of Christ satisfying God his once for all sacrifice, and his perfecting of us, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. So all this depends on that therefore that was in the beginning of this passage which we read. See, a satisfied God is the basis for everything, for everything in the New Testament. <clears throat> See, could our hearts be sprinkled from an evil conscience apart from Christ? <clears throat> could we hold fast our faith if we were still polluted in our own blood? What would be our faith be in? Could we assemble together? Could we provoke one another to love and good works? If we did not know God, these would be works of iniquity. And could we have boldness to enter into the presence of God with the wrath of God abiding on us? No, none of this works apart from Christ satisfying God. See, in the, inherent in the Old Covenant is God's dissatisfaction with imperfect man. But in the New Covenant... Nothing works if God isn't satisfied. Every promise and every command assumes that we have a satisfied God. <clears throat> because the new covenant is a covenant where men are near to their God. 
but we have been perfected by the offering of Christ. God has been satisfied with the perfect sacrifice. And praise God, we can draw nigh to him by the blood of Christ. God is satisfied, and we have been made holy in him.